In the 1940s, scientists and engineers changed the world forever when they invented the atomic bomb. In the Cold War that followed, the military-industrial complex would change the world again by converting the immense productive potential of America and the Soviet Union towards producing ever newer, more powerful or more diverse versions of this potentially apocalyptic weapon by the tens of thousands. And in so doing, entrenched in the minds of generations, the subtle but constant fear of sudden and total atomic annihilation. Late and post-Cold War agreements helped reverse that nuclear arms buildup. And in the 90s, 2000s and 2010s, the world steadily shed ever more active nuclear warheads. Cut to 2023, however, and basically wherever you look, disarmament is out, nuclear modernization or expansion is in, and hundreds of billions of dollars in new warheads and delivery systems are very much back on the procurement menu. And so today, essentially, we're going to ask why and how. What are the core factors driving countries to invest so much in renewing and expanding their nuclear arsenals? And also, what are some of the industrial challenges they face in doing so? Because, as it turns out, if you barely build nuclear warheads for 30 years, starting the process up again can be a little bit difficult. So to look at this topic, I'm essentially going to divide the video up into three main parts. Firstly, we'll cover the history and theory, the original Cold War nuclear buildup, the process of disarmament, and why countries are now choosing to recapitalize their nuclear forces in a big way. Then we're going to look at some of the underlying industrial and engineering factors, what it means to have an aging nuclear arsenal, why you might be faced with the retire, rebuild or replace decision, and also cover some of the things a country needs if it's going to produce nuclear weapons and appropriate delivery systems. Finally, we'll look at the five official global nuclear weapon states, the USA, Russia, China, France and the UK, and examine what they're doing with their nuclear arsenals, what sort of challenges they're facing, and of course challenge the ever-present myth of Russia's nukes not working. There are of course more nuclear weapon states, but for the sake of length, we'll cover those in the future. I'll add the obvious caveats that many nations are pretty secretive about their nuclear arsenal, and so this video is going to feature a lot of estimates and reason speculation, sources in the description. Another thing to say is that nuclear war by its very nature should be a horrifying and confronting subject. I figure the two ways to deal with a subject like that are either to be consistently sombre throughout, or to take the traditional Australian approach that if something is going to be horrifying, it should at least be funny too. So understand if the dark humour gets pretty heavy in this one, it's not because this isn't a serious topic, but rather because it couldn't be more serious. On that note, it's probably time to jump into the fun world of nuclear proliferation and modernization. But first, and with my great thanks, I need to welcome back a returning sponsor. Whether you're talking about Ukraine, the Middle East, or global events in general, in any given week, there might be a daunting amount of news for people to follow, and far more than I can fit in a single one-hour video. That's one reason I've been a long-term fan of Ground News. Ground News is a combination website and app that tries to give readers a more objective and data-driven way to consume news. They provide updates on hundreds of stories a day with quick visual breakdowns, flagging elements like media ownership. If you look, for example, at this story about Russia approving a record defense budget, you'll see which sources cover the topic and find potentially relevant context like ownership information. Ground News also makes it relatively easy to compare headlines. And if you decide to take advantage of their new comparison feature, then with one click you can identify recurring differences between reporting at different ends of the political spectrum. That tool might be a useful first step to identify potential trends across dozens of different headlines. Ground News also now has something called the Blind Spot Feed, which specifically seeks to highlight stories that might be receiving disproportionate coverage from different parts of the political spectrum. So if you're interested, now is probably a great time to give Ground News a try. Right now, they're offering a Black Friday sale, and if you subscribe before November 30th, you'll get 40% off their Vantage plan. That includes access to the My News Bias feature, which allows you to track and dashboard your news consumption over time. And the link for that offer is, of course, in the description. So with that said, and my thanks, let's get back to the presentation. I imagine just about everyone listening to this video already knows how humanity entered the atomic warfare age. The most expensive American weapons development program of World War II gave it the world's first operational nuclear bombs. The second most expensive US development program of World War II gave it the B-29 bomber capable of delivering them. And on the 6th and 9th of August, 1945, those devices would be deployed against the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The US would end the Second World War as the world's wealthiest nation and its sole possessor of nuclear weapons. What's less well known is what happened immediately after the war ended. Having developed the most destructive weapon in human history, the US's next step was to get rid of most of the Manhattan Project workforce. Some production facilities were worn out or shut down, with further development ongoing, but impacted. And in June 1946, the US government put a proposal to the United Nations Atomic Energy Commission that would essentially put in place an international system of monitoring and regulation to ban nuclear weapons. 
The plan was for an international authority to regulate everything from mining and refining to nuclear power plant operation, with the Americans undertaking to get rid of their atomic arsenal once all of these other safeguards to stop any other power obtaining nuclear weapons were then in place. In essence, while the first response of many strategy game players when they become the first person in a game to develop nukes is to begin a war of global conquest, for a brief window it seemed like America was attempting to leverage its nuclear monopoly into global disarmament. The Soviet counterproposal to that suggestion was essentially that America should get rid of all of its nuclear weapons first, and then the rest of the world could talk about regulation and inspections. For some reason, giving up their nuclear monopoly with no guarantee the Soviets wouldn't develop weapons of their own didn't appeal to the Americans and no international ban or agreement was reached. In 1949, the Soviets would detonate their own nuclear device, the American nuclear monopoly would be broken, and it was game on for the Cold War nuclear arms race. Having been challenged to an arms race, the US military industrial complex did its thing. In 1945, the US had two ready and available warheads. By 1950, the Soviets had assembled five, and the US had close to 300. By 1960, the United States had more than 18,000 nuclear warheads, and the Soviets' 1600. This rapid growth was made possible only by the massive development of supporting industry on a truly lavish scale. Weapons-grade fissile material would have to be produced by the ton. Warhead production complexes capable of producing or refurbishing thousands of warheads per year would have to be put together, and the need to produce the missiles, aircraft, and other delivery systems necessary to potentially carry these thousands of warheads to potential targets would drive a significant part of the largest peacetime military buildup in living memory. By the 70s, the US and Soviet Union probably had enough firepower to call game over on human civilization several times over. In 1975, the two powers had north of 46,000 nuclear warheads between them. So, of course, there were powerful and influential voices on both sides saying that that couldn't possibly be enough and calling out governments and decision makers for being weak on national defense. Because clearly, if you don't have enough atomic firepower to delete every opposing population center, large in the Robbo's family cattle station, you're doing it wrong. US warhead counts would peak in the mid-1960s, but the Soviets would keep building and expanding well into the 80s. Those of you interested in getting some window into some of the thinking of the era should consider watching the 1979 docudrama First Strike. Produced with the cooperation of US military personnel, it shows a scenario in which the Soviet Union launches a surprise first strike on the United States, destroying most of the US nuclear arsenal on the ground and forcing a quick surrender by the American president. The second part of the production is a series of interviews and arguments as to why America clearly needs to plow additional resources into next-generation nuclear capabilities. It's worth noting that by 1980, the US had north of 23,000 nuclear warheads, but hey, that was a reduction on 1975 levels, and by 1980, the Soviets had more than 30,000. It would clearly be unpatriotic to come second to the Soviets in anything, including the ability to KO human civilization, so it was time to fire up the money machine and get the Peacekeeper missile fielded. Then, even before the end of the Soviet Union, the pattern began to reverse. A series of arms limitation and reduction treaties would be signed first between the US and the Soviet Union, and then the US and the Russian Federation. Test detonations of atomic weapons would be banned, entire classes of delivery system retired, and the number of global active warheads began to crash. Between 1985 and 1991, global inventories fell by more than 13,500 warheads. Between 1991 and 96, inventory shed another 21,400. And by 2003, the world was below 1960 levels and still falling. For many around the world, each disarmament step probably brought a slight reduction in the constant anxiety that the Cold War had often induced. But with inventories and expenditure going into reverse after decades of constant investment, there was also an ongoing transformation in how many countries built and maintained their nuclear forces. Because while the peace dividend essentially came for almost all aspects of the NATO and former Soviet military industrial complexes, it came for the nuclear weapons sector more than most. With the Soviet Union now gone and it clearly being impossible that NATO would ever again face a potential peer competitor, many nations fundamentally changed how they handled their nuclear weapons program. Many nations entirely shut down their production of military fissile materials, instead deciding they were going to rely on the massive stockpiles left over from the Cold War. Production of new atomic pits or warheads slowed to a crawl or even stopped, with the last fully new American warheads for several decades being introduced before the fall of the Soviet Union. Instead, nations like the US, UK or France looked at the massive pile of warheads and delivery systems they had left over and decided it would be much, much cheaper to simply extend the lifespan of those systems as opposed to continuing to manufacture new ones. 
In the US, in one case, nuclear reduction actually meant rolling back weapon systems by at least one generation. In 1986, the Americans had introduced their LGM-118 Peacekeeper ICBM. That system was capable of carrying up 10 or more MIRVs, multiple independent re-entry vehicles. Essentially a system where warheads could separate from a missile at the appropriate time in order to go after different independent targets. During testing, this is what eight MIRVs re-entering at the same time from a single Peacekeeper launch looks like. But for a while, it looked like negotiations with the Russians would limit every ICBM to only carrying one warhead. And so keeping the very heavy, very expensive Peacekeeper in service didn't make a huge amount of sense. Instead, despite the Americans withdrawing from the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty and the Russians withdrawing from START II in 2002, thus essentially killing any legal restriction on having multiple independent re-entry vehicles on your ICBMs, the final Peacekeepers would be retired in 2005 and the US would fully roll back to the older Minuteman III ICBM, a system which had first entered service in 1970. Relying on the gargantuan pile of leftover warhead systems, fissile materials, etc. left over from the Cold War allowed nations for a long time to save enormous amounts of money. Now, if you're driving an old shipbox of a car that was built in the automotive equivalent of the Middle Ages and it starts to break down or become a bit unreliable, maybe that's okay. But when people start telling you there might be safety or reliability issues with your nuclear missiles, eh, you might want to pay some more attention. Deterrence, after all, relies on your opponent believing that your nuclear weapons and delivery systems will function more or less as advertised. And so eventually, nuclear stewardship and maintenance can become a national security issue. Now, more than 30 years after the end of the Cold War, many nations feel they're hitting that sort of point, where aging warheads and delivery systems force them to make a choice. Either they can choose to retire a system in its entirety, giving up the capability, they can try to continue to rebuild and extend the lifespan of those systems, or they can come up with something new to replace it. And with the world's current nuclear power seemingly deciding that cool kids don't do unilateral disarmament, often the choice made across the inventory is some combination of all three. We are going to look at what the various nuclear powers are planning to do with their nuclear arsenals, but first we're going to have to look at some of the critical factors that shape those decisions. In simple terms, how and why might a country choose to build an atomic bomb, and what are some of the things they need in order to do so? Because make no mistake, building or even maintaining nuclear weapons is not something you do on a strategic lark. If you're an existing nuclear power, then simply staying one is going to be a constant and not insignificant financial expense. Even countries with relatively small nuclear arsenals like the UK or France will typically spend double-digit percentages of their defence spending on maintaining their nuclear arsenal. And if you're a non-nuclear country acting like you might want to become one, well, then you may need to be ready to pay not just for your program, but also for any sanctions that might be sent in your direction. But assuming a country does decide that it wants to possess nuclear weapons, it's faced with a doctrinal choice as to what it wants those nuclear weapons to be able to do. This is essentially a question of your understanding of the role of nuclear weapons, and while there are a huge array of different ideas and conceptions, if you wanted to put out two examples of extreme opposite ends of the spectrum, I'd compare the nuclear warfighters to the supporters of minimal credible deterrence. To simplify things more than a little bit, for the most stereotypical advocate of minimal credible deterrence, or MCD, nuclear weapons are horrible, nuclear war is horrible, cannot be won and must not be fought. As such, one of the only reasonable uses for nuclear weapons is to provide a deterrent against an opponent who may otherwise pose some sort of existential threat to you or your allies. The goal from a force design perspective is to have a nuclear arsenal capable of inflicting such great damage on an opponent that they're unwilling to accept the risk that you might use it. And so in terms of design and doctrine, these might be forces that are optimised to target politically and economically valuable locations like cities, called counter-value targets, as opposed to trying to accomplish any battlefield goal or destroying an opponent's nuclear force, counter-force targeting. Another key milestone might be to have what is called a survivable second strike capability. And what that means in a nutshell is that you are relatively confident that you can face tank all of the nuclear firepower your opponent can launch in a surprise attack and still have the capacity to shoot back after the bombs have fallen and ruin their day so badly that they won't shoot first in the first place. There are various ways you could try and build up a survivable second strike capability, but the system perhaps most popularly associated with the role is the nuclear ballistic missile submarine and the submarine launch ballistic missile. Here, the magic number is to usually have at least four nuclear submarines, which means at any given time at least one can be out on patrol, where it functions as a continuous, survivable deterrent. Because the submarine can go hide somewhere at sea, with its only job being to not be found and not get killed, unless of course the crew receive appropriate orders and word that the homeland has been attacked or destroyed, 
in which case the response might be to sail to an appropriate launch location, pop the tubes, and then ensure that the leadership in the offending nation will have every minute from the launch warning to impact to reconsider all of the decisions that led them to this point and to consider the tremendous possibilities for their country going forward in the glass export business. It's an absolutely horrifying concept with very little battlefield utility, and that's the point. At the other extreme, you might have planners who look at the immense explosive power of nuclear weapons and say, are you sure I can't use that? Even in a scenario where everyone in the room acknowledges that nuclear war is horrible, it's usually still going to be someone's job to figure out how to fight and potentially win one anyway. And so, for example, you might be tempted to build tactical nuclear weapons to help offset the superior conventional military strength of an opponent. You might build nuclear bunker busters as the most practical means to attack bunkers buried deep underground. Or you invest in nuclear-tipped torpedoes or anti-ship missiles to improve your odds against an enemy carrier battle group, for example. Or maybe you just want intermediate nuclear weapons to provide a warning and signaling mechanism to help you control the escalation ladder, something like the ASMPA missile for France. If you widen the role of the nuclear weapon and your budget, you're likely to see all sorts of weird and wonderful systems spring up. You may also see systems that are well configured towards potentially taking out an opponent's nuclear potential. This sort of counter-force targeting was a major focus of many Cold War planners. And in the end, it might require different weapon systems to a pure counter-value force. During much of the Cold War, for example, submarine launch ballistic missiles just didn't have the accuracy to go after opposing missile silos. So if you wanted something that could hit close enough and hard enough, you were probably going to use a silo-based ICBM. Obviously, a nation doesn't have to sit at one extreme end of the spectrum or another. You don't have to be purely wedded to a minimal credible deterrent, nor go full fallout cosplay and decide that every weapon system in your army needs a nuclear option. But doctrine will shape requirements and the warheads and systems you need. Then you have to build the things. Here, there are a few factors that are going to drive the ability of most countries to build or maintain nuclear weapons. Firstly, you need some fissile material, something that is amenable to being the M in equals MC squared, with the two main options available being weapons-grade uranium and plutonium. And if you're an existing nuclear power, this may not be that much of a challenge. Grandad probably produced the stuff by the ton during the Cold War. But if you're not an existing nuclear weapon state, this might be one of the hard parts. It's also worth noting that depending on the design of the warhead, there's a huge range of other materials you might need to be able to access or manufacture. Tritium is an interesting example. It's often brought up here because it's expensive and has a half-life of 12 years, which means if you have a certain quantity of tritium, half of it will decay over the course of 12 years. But it's also very useful for boosting the yield of certain nuclear weapon designs. The core point here is that you're going to need access to the materials and inputs you need to produce the kind of force you identify as your requirement. Another key factor if you're talking about building the relatively more common implosion type nuclear weapon is the ability to build what's called a nuclear pit. This is the core, if you like, of your warhead. Through much the Cold War and through the modern day, most pits are going to be plutonium. And the ability to work with plutonium and shape it into a workable pit is a particular industrial capability. In ways, plutonium is an annoying bloody material. It loves corroding, obviously self-irradiates, and has a somewhat schizophrenic relationship between temperature expansion and contraction. During the days of the Manhattan Project, attempts to tame plutonium to make it more workable often came down to simply alloying it with various things to see what would cause it to behave. One of the things they hit upon was alloying it with gallium, something which is still done today. And the ability to produce new pits safely and at scale is one of the challenges, for example, that the United States struggles with. During the Cold War, annual production capacities in the USSR and USA might run to thousands per annum. But with the end of the Cold War, the United States completely stopped new weapon pit production and started simply recycling the ones from existing and retired weapons. Now the goal is to restore a production capacity of 80 per annum by 2030, something which may not be achieved and is likely to cost billions of dollars. Once you have your fissile material in your pit, you need the ability to manufacture and then maintain nuclear warheads. Unfortunately for humanity, this is not impossibly difficult, but unfortunately for maintainers and governments who want to maintain these systems, it's also not simple. Delivery systems like missiles need to be regularly tested to ensure they remain viable, and warheads too need to be inspected and, if necessary, refurbished or retired. The difficulty with testing, however, to make sure that your pits and warheads still work or that a new design you've come up with functions as designed is that most nuclear powers have agreed to cease nuclear testing. During the Cold War, the way you verified your weapons worked was by pressing the button and seeing if they went boom. The United States government waged a sustained nuclear war against the state of Nevada, detonating more than 900 nuclear devices there. The Soviets detonated more than 900 devices, mostly in Kazakhstan. 
The French staged more than 200 tests, mostly divided between Algeria and French Polynesia, and Her Majesty's government in the United Kingdom, perhaps finally understanding the dire threat posed by the emu, would detonate some of their test devices in Australian territory at places like Maralinga and Emu Field. The human consequences of many of those tests were dire, and the birds of course survived. In 2023, most nations are instead forced to rely on computer testing. That requires both a very good model and a very powerful supercomputer. For countries like the UK and France which share some relevant infrastructure, that may not be a problem. For North Korea by contrast, it probably is, but they've just tested their devices the old-fashioned way. Notably, Russia had previously ratified the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, but recently withdrew that ratification. That's an interesting development and one we'll discuss more in a bit. The final element we'll be looking at with a lot of countries today is the requirement for delivery systems. Often one of the most expensive parts of a nuclear program is not the warheads themselves, but the systems required to get them to enemy territory. There are simple, low-tech options available, like gravity bombs where you drop a nuclear device from an aircraft, but building reliable and accurate intercontinental ballistic missiles capable of hitting targets on the other side of the world, that's another undertaking entirely. And just like nuclear warheads, and in fact often more than nuclear warheads themselves, delivery systems break down with time, require maintenance, and eventually rebuild or replacement. And the combination of different strategic requirements coupled with cost and complexity means that many nuclear nations don't have the full suite of available delivery options. In any case, now that we've got a little bit of an understanding of some of the potential bottlenecks in any nuclear program, let's have a look at the various nuclear powers and how each of them are dealing with changing strategic circumstances, aging weapons, and the retire, rebuild, or replace question. To do that, we'll look at the countries with the largest stockpiles first, the USA and Russia, followed by China, and then France and the United Kingdom with their own very distinctive nuclear arsenals. So let's start with the first country in the world to field atomic weapons, the United States. A lot of the official US thinking around the role of nuclear weapons is contained in something called the Nuclear Posture Review. That used to be a separate document, but in 2022, it was included within the overall national defense strategy. That and other documents tell us a lot about how America views atomic weapons and when they would consider using them. They make clear, for example, that the US isn't a nuclear non-first use state and instead established the US would likely use nukes in, quote, extreme circumstances, end quote, to defend the vital interests of the United States and its partners. US doctrine does, however, reject the use or threatened use of nuclear weapons against non-nuclear weapon states that are party to and compliant with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. In other words, you're only in the crosshairs either if you're a nuclear power or if you're a country that is breaching the Non-Proliferation Treaty and perhaps trying to become a nuclear power. I'll give you three guesses as to what country, beginning with the letter I and ending with RAN, might fall into that category. US documents describe the demand for nuclear weapons being driven by the fact that US has at least two primary nuclear competitors, has to deal with a now nuclear-armed North Korea, and has various commitments to partners and allies around the world. In the event that deterrence fails, the strategy says that the US, quote, will strive to end any conflict at the lowest level of damage possible, and on the best terms achievable for the USA and its allies and partners, end quote. But it's the recurring commitment to allies and partners that makes US strategy documents so interesting. The US has long established an interest in limiting global nuclear proliferation. The fewer countries that have nukes, arguably the better as far as US strategy is concerned. And one of the ways the US achieves that is to place various allies and partners under its nuclear umbrella, suggesting the US will use its nuclear weapons to deter any nuclear attack upon that ally, and in exchange, that ally, say for example South Korea, will refrain from developing nuclear weapons of its own. This helps reinforce American alliances and influence around the world, but it also demands a nuclear arsenal capable of providing that sort of protection. The US has, for example, often stationed nuclear weapons in countries like Belgium, Germany, Italy, and the Netherlands, still under the control of American personnel, but intended for delivery by host nation aircraft. To meet these various strategic commitments, the Federation of Atomic Scientists estimated that in 2023, the US had the second largest number of deployed warheads of any power on Earth. The full nuclear triad, consisting of 400 ground-based Minuteman III ICBMs, Trident submarine-launched missiles fired from the Navy's 14 Ohio-class nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines, and a mixture of nuclear cruise missiles and old-school gravity bombs for delivery by the Air Force's bombers or by some multi-role fighters. In total, this amounted to approximately 1,770 deployed warheads, a further 1,938 reserved warheads in case the first 1,700 weapons of mass destruction weren't enough, and a retirement pool of more than 1,500 warheads awaiting dismantlement. That is clearly a very large, very scary atomic arsenal. 
But from a modernization perspective, it does have a problem. Namely, that a lot of those delivery systems and warheads are getting pretty old at this point. Since the end of the Cold War, America's nuclear power has basically been built on constantly refurbishing warheads and delivery systems that were left over. As far as we know, the US didn't build any entirely new nuclear warheads in the 90s, 2000s, or 2010s. Policy during the Obama era was clearly against the development or deployment of any new types of nuclear weapon, and so the National Nuclear Security Administration for decades now has overwhelmingly been working with what it had on hand. The agency has carried out life extensions, usually adding 20 to 30 years to the expected lifespan of different weapons, while in other cases it's modified existing warheads to address defects, improve safety and security, replace limited life components, or to add new features. An example of such a modification might be the W76-2. This is where the agency took an original W76 warhead with a yield of about 100 kilotons equivalent and modified it to dial that yield down to maybe 5 to 7 kilotons to give American nuclear missile submarines a weapon capable of pulverizing a specific target without annihilating the entire surrounding area. The problem, of course, is that you can't refurbish the same warheads forever. And eventually, new ones are going to be required. But warheads aren't even the clearest example of an industrial bottleneck in the American nuclear system. As the US Government Accountability Office puts it, the US nuclear weapons stockpile depends on facilities that are, on average, about 50 years old. And quote, the processing of enriched uranium used in nuclear weapons is still conducted in an Oppenheimer era facility built in 1945, end quote. One area of particular concern to some American strategists is the country's ability to produce new plutonium pits for nuclear warheads. During the heights of the Cold War, American production capacity for pits probably crossed into the triple digits. And while various report sources and experts do clash on the detail, it seems to be reasonably agreed that properly stewarded and cared for, an American-built plutonium pit might be good for at least 80 years of service. So in the post-Soviet world, American planners essentially shut down pit production for weapons and instead focused on using the thousands of the things they still had on hand that were surplus to requirements. The problem is you can't do that forever and no one's entirely sure what will happen when plutonium cores reach truly ridiculous ages. We can't have 100% confidence in how a 120-year-old plutonium pit might behave, for example, because, as far as we know, there has never been a 120-year-old plutonium pit. But the goal US policymakers eventually set is that by 2030, the country needs to be capable of producing 80 plutonium pits per annum, once again, split across two key sites. In 2022, a number of US officials indicated that even hitting 80 per year by 2030 might not be achievable, and the GAO identified between 18 and 24 billion US dollars in potential costs just to hit that capacity. But the argument goes, whatever the cost, without new plutonium pits, eventually America's warheads may age out of safety, reliability, or even basic functionality. And when you're talking about something like a nuclear warhead, all three of those things are probably pretty high priorities. As well as refreshing its ability to produce new warheads, the US is also committed to modernizing its various delivery systems. And here, we'll start with America's ground-based strategic deterrent, its ICBMs. Here, the currently stated US plan is to replace all of the Minuteman III ICBMs, which first entered service in the 1970s, on a one-to-one -one basis with the new LGM-35A Sentinel. The plan includes a buy of 642 missiles to support a deployed force of 400, plus testing and reserves. The program is intended to deliver an initial operating capacity in 2029, with all 400 missiles in service by 2036. Until then, the old Minuteman III's will just have to keep soldiering on. Now, America's nuclear missile silos are spread across three US states, meaning the great states of Montana, North Dakota, and Wyoming play two very important roles in American nuclear strategy. The first is to base the ground-based strategic deterrent, and in so doing, give America access to a nuclear weapon capable of relatively accurately delivering large warheads anywhere in the world. The second, in the event of an all-out nuclear war, is to give opposing nuclear planners more priority targets to shoot at, so they spend more warheads trying to destroy silos in Wyoming or North Dakota, as opposed to American cities or states with more electoral college votes. This has sometimes been jokingly called the nuclear sponge role. And it was a role former Defense Secretary Jim Mathis described his confirmation hearing in 2017 in the following terms. Quote, it's clear they, in reference to the silos, are so buried out in the central US that any enemy that wants to take us on is going to have to commit two, three, four weapons to make sure they take each one out. He went on to say, in other words, the ICBM force provides a cost-imposing strategy on an adversary, end quote. For their part, political leaders and senators from these states seem to be very happy with the arrangement. 
The states receive a constant stream of federal dollars and economic stimulus for hosting the silos, and in exchange all they have to do is play blocker for any incoming counter-force strikes. The single most expensive component of US nuclear modernization plans is probably the replacement of the 14 existing Ohio-class SSBNs with a new generation of 12 Columbia-class boats. With the displacement of more than 20,000 tons, these are going to be the largest nuclear submarines America has ever fielded. With the first new submarine expected to enter the fleet in 2031, and the total cost for the fleet of 12 is currently projected at 139 billion US dollars. Despite the high costs involved, the scuttlebutt is that the US Navy is very protective of this project. So even in a, shall we call it a very interesting budget environment like the US currently finds itself in, the Columbia class, as well as their missiles and eventually their W-93 successor warheads, are very likely to make it into service. In the interim, the Trident missiles and their warheads aboard the existing Ohios have received some upgrades and changes. We've already talked about life extension programs and the modification of a couple of warheads for much lower yield, but it's reported there may also have been significant improvements in things like fusing. In 2017, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists put out an article on a new fuse that had been integrated with the Navy's W76-1 warhead. That fuse was intended to optimise when, during a nuclear warhead's flight path, it would detonate. Against a target like a city, that improvement would probably be much for muchness. But against a hardened target, like a nuclear missile silo, an improvement in fusing might mean you have to fire fewer of your own missiles to be confident of destroying your target's silos. And because you're doing it without falling back on the simpler expedient of simply using a larger nuclear warhead, you're also potentially minimising the collateral damage of doing so. Although I doubt any surrounding environment is going to be particularly thrilled if a nuclear weapon is used to detonate a silo containing another nuclear weapon. I bring this up mostly to illustrate that not every measure of nuclear modernization or capability has to come down to warheads, yields, or delivery system counts. While the US Navy is getting its submarines, the US Air Force is getting more than just upgrades to its silo-based missiles. They're also getting a new strategic bomber, the B-21 Raider, capable of both nuclear and non-nuclear missions, a new nuclear-armed cruise missile for the B-52, the LRSO, which is a program which may provide around 1,000 missiles, in part because, as one source put it, the existing air launch cruise missiles are, quote, beginning to show reliability problems, end quote. Notably, the cost per missile of the LRSO is expected to be somewhere between 5 and 10 times what America might otherwise spend on a cruise missile. But I guess when your pitch is that you're replacing an increasingly unreliable nuclear weapon, you probably get a pretty smooth ride through when it comes to budget time. And then finally, there is perhaps the strangest item in the US nuclear modernization plan. It's a life extension program for a large family of US nuclear weapons that will, of course, cost billions of dollars and will loudly and clearly demonstrate to the entire world the technological marvels that US industry can produce. Yeah, no, I'm actually talking about the B-61 gravity bomb. These are old-school airdropped nuclear weapons that were designed during the 1960s that are getting another life extension program and a guidance tail kit to give them JDAM-like accuracy. And give the US Air Force a nuclear weapon that you can use in the plethora of scenarios where you want to nuke something, but you also presumably enjoy a pretty healthy degree of air superiority because you need to fly your F-35 or equivalent delivery platform within bombing range of the target. At first glance, the decision to continue retaining and modernising the B-61 is a bit of an interesting one. We are, after all, in an era of stealthy cruise missiles and increasingly hypersonics. And despite having absolutely abysmal performance characteristics relative to any of those other options... The B-61 isn't even cheap, pushing solidly, reportedly, into the eight-figure range per unit. But for a variety of reasons, the Air Force seems to be keeping it. It's the system that's currently used in the nuclear sharing agreements with the various NATO countries. It's the only currently planned way to give something like the F-35 a nuclear strike role. Plus, I guess if the 2020s are going to increasingly recycle old Cold War-era storylines, we may as well keep some of the old props too. Jokes aside, the weapon obviously has a niche that it seeks to fill. But you have to admit that in the 2020s, this thing is more than a bit anachronistic. So having gone through America's nuclear shopping cart, what's the final estimated damage? In 2021, the Congressional Budget Office projected a cost of roughly $60 billion per year for the US nuclear arsenal between 2021 and 2030, primarily driven by new missiles and submarines. Two years later, the estimate for 2023 through 2032 had risen to almost $76 billion per year. Now, notably, that's not just the cost of modernization. Most of it is just the cost of keeping the lights on and maintaining capability as it currently stands. But it is still, even in a nation like America, a very significant amount of money. 
And perhaps in a world where there was no other country with an equivalent or larger nuclear arsenal, US decision makers might decide it was too much money. However, for better or worse, that's not the world we live in. So, and you knew this was coming, that means we have to talk about Russia. Because whatever else one might say about the Russian military, the Russian economy, or Russia's status as a great power, on paper, from 1949 until the present day, they remain one of the world's foremost nuclear powers. And on simple count of deployed warheads, they actually retain the number one spot. The first thing to say is that for many of the years after the fall of the Soviet Union, the Russian Federation took a very different view of its nuclear weapons than the US did of its. The US found itself in conventional terms militarily unchallenged, which diminished the relative role nuclear weapons had once played. The Russians, by contrast, were experiencing the 1990s, which meant a very different thing in that part of the world to the Western European or American experience. The new Russian armed forces were a splintered and corroded shadow of the old Soviet military. The economy was in the toilet, and a significant fraction of the military-industrial complex was now located in foreign countries. In that environment, a number of Russian figures looked to nuclear weapons as their only effective remaining strategic deterrent against the more militarily powerful NATO states. The man you're looking at on screen there is Marshal Sergeyev. He was the defense minister of the Russian Federation for roughly four years, starting in 1997, and before that, his previous role was as the head of the strategic rocket forces. Now, when a military officer rises to an apex role like defense minister or chief of the general staff, it's generally expected that they'll put loyalties to their own branch behind them. Sergeyev, by contrast, had other ideas. And as the story goes, he spent significant parts of his tenure looking out for his old team and making sure that of the limited procurement funding available, a significant share would still be allocated to maintaining or modernizing the rocket forces. For the rest of the military, this was probably a terrible idea, nor was it enough to entirely insulate the strategic rocket forces from the fact it was still the bloody 1990s. But it helps explain why, even through some incredibly financially difficult years, the Russians still focused the resources they had on slowing the decay in the nuclear complex and maintaining warhead and launch account. As Putin rose to power and the economic resources available increased, so too did Russia's nuclear modernization efforts meaning that today on paper, Russia has one of the most diverse and largest nuclear arsenals in the world. According to the Federation of American Scientists, who I'll use as my source for most warhead counts throughout this episode, when you consider those warheads either deployed or in reserve, but not those that are completely retired and awaiting dismantlement, Russia recently had about 321 ICBM launchers, mounting about 834 deployed warheads, with about half of those launchers being the Yars Road mobile system that you see on screen there, which to my knowledge has never been taken through a McDonald's drive through but I would pay good money to see it. At sea, or potentially more often in dock, the Russians have 11 nuclear missile submarines with their SLBMs, a supply of nuclear weapons for their strategic and tactical aviation, and missiles for a variety of other forces, including air defense. There are reportedly nuclear torpedoes, nuclear anti-submarine weapons, nuclear anti-ship missiles, and nuclear anti-ballistic missiles. If you're asking whether or not I did in fact say anti-ballistic missile use, the answer is yes. One of Russia's believed solutions to the missile defense problem is to use nuclear missiles to shoot down incoming nuclear missiles. In total, the FAS estimates that Russia had 1,816 deployed warheads, 2,815 reserved warheads, and 1,400 retired warheads. There's a personal observation I'll make here that you might observe a potential disconnect between Russian nuclear doctrine and the Russian nuclear arsenal. Russia's declared nuclear policy puts pretty tight guardrails over when a nuclear weapon might be used. They're there to respond to existential threats to the Russian federations, attacks that might destroy Russia's ability to retaliate, or attacks against Russia using weapons of mass destruction, things of that sort. But the Russian nuclear arsenal is a nuclear warfighter's dream. Non-strategic weapons are present in triple-digit quantities, and for just about any tactical role you can think of, the Russians have a nuclear system for it whether that be hunting submarines or lighting up a general area of the sky because you know a stealth aircraft is up there, but not exactly where. That's not to say these systems wouldn't have any use when trying to control and dominate the escalation ladder, but it does strike me as an interesting use of limited available resources, especially in the context of the conventional limitations we've seen in Ukraine. Private Conscriptovich doesn't have optics on his rifle, your next generation tanks and fighters are stuck in development hell, but hey, at least you have some nuclear dumb bombs for your tactical aviation. Resource prioritization questions aside, there is an argument here that I want to call a myth that I think is important to address. Not just because it's common, and I've seen it repeated a lot, but also because it's potentially very dangerous. 
And the argument basically goes that for whatever reason, be it age, neglect, corruption, insufficient investment, whatever, Russia's nuclear arsenal is in such a decrepit state that the nukes don't actually work, either because of issues with the warhead delivery system or something else, and that every time the Russians rattle the nuclear sabre, they're just bluffing. Now, there are two important caveats I want to put first. Number one is I obviously don't have any first-hand understanding of the state of the Russian nuclear arsenal. And somehow I feel if I became the first YouTuber to request a tour of Russia's nuclear storage sites, the most likely answer would be a no, and I'd be even more concerned if it was a yes. Point two is that there are absolutely some horrifying anecdotes as to the state of the Soviet and later Russian nuclear forces. There are documented cases of explosions and accidents on submarines, former nuclear missile officers who describe missiles arriving from the factories in clearly non-operational states, and accounts of things like silos significantly filled with water and equipment that just doesn't work. But when you're talking about a force of thousands of warheads, there's a very wide gulf between part of the force being defective some of the time, and most or all of the force being defective all the time. I can also tell some horror stories about certain American nuclear facilities, but in the end, everyone's pretty confident that their nuclear deterrent will work broadly as advertised. So let's quickly run through some of the arguments as to why Russia's nuclear forces may not be in the greatest condition, and check whether they hold up to scrutiny. Problem one would be if Russia was short on a critical input, like fissile materials or something like tritium. With regards to a potential shortage of fissile materials, the answer is just no. Russia is generally believed to have so much weapons-grade fissile material, mostly left over from the Cold War era, that the most appropriate country for stockpile comparison sank isn't the United States, but rather all other countries combined. But okay, you might ask, what about things like tritium? Now here it's impossible to prove whether or not Russia has improperly disposed of the tritium it has or can produce, but what we can do is make some reasoned guesses about production capacity and potential present stockpiles. Tritium is generally produced in specialised nuclear reactors. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union had the capacity to produce a shitload of tritium. Post-Cold War, the number of reactors believed to be dedicated to producing the stuff fell, and by the mid-1990s, the main games in town were two tritium production reactors at Mayak, that's Chelyabinsk 65 for the old school among you, with the reactors respectively being named Ruslan and Ludmila, with Ludmila being relatively young for a Soviet reactor. Now, there are a lot of rumours and debates back and forth about the status of these two reactors. In particular, there's some question marks over some problems Ruslan may have had in the 2000s and whether or not it's still operational. So far as external sources go, as of 2006, the Norwegian Radiation Protection Authority said both were in operation, and I can find reference by the World Nuclear Association in 2022 to at the very least Ludmilla still being in operation. The Russians are also believed to be producing a replacement tritium production reactor, but it isn't yet online. So as far as I can see, Russia probably retained significant tritium production capacity well past the end of the Cold War, and even if there were a shortfall, there would still be part of the Soviet stockpile left over that could be recovered by breaking apart and retiring old warheads or simply accessing stockpiles. 1980 was very roughly three and a half tritium half-lives ago and about as many half-life games ago. Even if you round that up to four, you'd still have 6% of all tritium produced in 1980 left over and a greater percentage as you moved forward year by year. The Soviet Union hit a warhead peak north of 40,000 in 1986, which means if you're trying to sustain an arsenal about 10% the size in 2023, the math sort of checks out. Corruption, sloth and incompetence in things like maintenance might be a greater threat, but there's always the question of estimating just how much damage they likely do. If you want a very approximate yardstick, look at the performance of Russian conventional forces in Ukraine. We've seen significant evidence that might point to the caustic effect of pre-war corruption on military readiness and capabilities. What we haven't seen is the Russian military being completely incapable of offensive operations, despite that corruption. In the absence of strong evidence to the contrary, I'm not sure why you'd assume things are much worse in the Russian strategic rocket forces. Then there's the question of warhead production and maintenance. Are Russia's nuclear warheads just getting too old? Are they poorly maintained? And as a result, may they be unreliable? But here, for a potentially surprising reason, Russia might actually be in a pretty decent state. The key here is the absolutely enormous size, scale, and production capacity of the Soviet nuclear weapons complex. Because Soviet production capacity was so over the top that even with significant downscaling in the post-Cold War era, there's still a lot of productive capacity left over. And part of the reason we assume that productive capacity was so high is because reportedly, Soviet nuclear weapons were in some ways a bit shit. Estimates range on just how long the plutonium pit in a US nuclear weapon will last before it needs to be replaced, but 80 years comes up relatively often. Warhead lifetime without a life extension program is shorter than that, but still quite long. 
By contrast, according to Oleg Bukharin, the average life of a Soviet nuclear pit was between 10 and 15 years. I checked that figure with some people in the field, and while they didn't know for certain, they did say it sounded about right to them. A paper in the early 2000s, which I'll link below, credited the relatively short lifespan to the fact that, quote, fissile components are not completely isolated from the surrounding environment as they are being made, perhaps due to well defects in pit casings. They are subject to corrosion and swelling, end quote. Now, presumably, the Soviets could have found a way to solve this problem, improve quality assurance standards, and move the worlds past the point they'd been on the T-34 during World War II. Or, as it turns out, you could just compensate by building a shit ton more pits and warheads and continually turning over your inventory. During the heights of the Cold War, that article estimates that the Soviets were capable of doing 14,000 warhead operations per year. That included manufacturing 4,000 new warheads, disassembling 4,000 old warheads, with the remaining operations being life extensions and maintenance. And after the Cold War ended, Russia reduced that complex, but it couldn't stop it the way the US, France or Britain did. Because if it had, even its newest weapons might have started becoming non-functional in the early 2000s. The article notes four significant Soviet warhead production facilities that, by 2005, had cut themselves down from 30,000 employees during Soviet times to a much more modest 8,000. But that's still a lot of people to have working in warhead facilities during a time when the austerity of the 1990s was still pretty recent. To add to all this, we have several examples of US officials going on record describing Russia as having a hot warhead production line, meaning it is currently producing new and refurbished warheads, and as far as I can tell, probably never stopped producing new and refurbished warheads for any significant period of time. So while the temptation may be to characterize a lot of Russian nuclear weapons as old and decrepit, a lot of them probably are going to be quite new. In fact, if there are significant problems in the Russian strategic forces, I expect they're not going to be with warhead production or fissile materials at all, but rather with issues like testing, where despite withdrawing its ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, Russia hasn't yet taken one of its old pits out to the backyard, pressed the button, and seen if it goes off. The other question mark area might be some of Russia's delivery systems, rather than the warheads themselves. And here, there's sometimes a significant discrepancy, system to system. The classic case here is, ironically enough, the darling of Russian state TV, the new Sarmat heavy ICBM. Sarmat was primarily designed to replace Russia's inventory of an old Soviet missile. That was the RS-36 Voivoda, with the cheery NATO call sign SS-18 Satan. R-36 was a proven missile with a significant problem. It was manufactured and maintained in Ukraine. Unsurprisingly, they don't do that anymore, and so Russia has been looking for a replacement. On paper, Sarmat is a horrifying 200-ton giant of a missile with a massive number of onboard re-entry vehicles and significant throw weight, but its test record is not the greatest. There were originally three tests scheduled for 2021, none of which happened. In April 2022, there was finally a successful test. We were told there would be three more over the course of the year, and none of those ended up happening. Finally, in the February of this year, it's been reported in Western sources that there was another failed test of the Sarmat missile. And so, of course, the Russians announced that year that the system was ready to go and was going on official combat duty. Now, as one commentator noted, the Soviet Union successfully tested the R-36 36 times before they put it into service. They tested the upgraded M2 version 20 times. Sarmat, by contrast, hasn't received anything like that level of testing. And so it's hard to see how even the Russians themselves would have a significant pool of empirical data proving what exactly the system could do. And indeed, the Russian nuclear missile test rate in general dropped significantly over the last decade. That might introduce some doubt as to the capability of at least some Russian nuclear delivery systems. But when you look at Russian nuclear modernization efforts more broadly, some efforts inspire considerably more confidence in their reliability than others. The bulk of Russia's ICBM modernization, for example, has actually focused on RS-24 Yars, which is basically a MERV version of the old Topol M. This wins points for basically being a derivative of an old proven system and having been tested pretty continuously since 2007. By the end of 2024, it's expected all remaining Topol M's will have been replaced with this new system. And given the testing record to date, I think the most reasonable assumption is that this system works. Similarly, Russia has been refreshing its SSBN fleet with a new design. The boats were designed in the 1990s, the first one commissioned in 2013, and about half a dozen are currently in service. Each are capable of carrying 16 of the new Bulava missiles with six warheads per missile. We have seen the submarines go to sea and do patrols, and we have seen the Bulava missile go through test firings. Also in the normal column, even if it might not be the greatest use of national resources, 
is Russia's announcement that they'll be restarting production of new build Tu-160 strategic bombers. That's notable not just because of the expense involved, but also the fact that Russia is choosing to restart production of an old design rather than come up with a new one. Finally, in this column of relatively normal nuclear modernization efforts, I also feel like I should mention the massive suite of dual-use systems. These are Russian weapons that are primarily used for conventional duties, but which can mount nuclear warheads. Iskander is a good example here. And we have seen in Ukraine time and time again that that system does work, is reliable, and is apparently accurate. My core point here is that enough of Russia's arsenal remains both new enough, but also basic and proven enough, that it should be considered credible. Of course, there are also a bunch of Russian nuclear modernization efforts, most of which I've talked about before, so I won't dwell on here, that don't exactly fall into the normal, reasonable, and proven column. Poseidon, for example, is reportedly a very long-range, nuclear-powered unmanned torpedo with a nuclear warhead, apparently designed to travel deep and fast, find its way to an opposing port, and then detonate. Contrary to the claims of Russian state TV, this system could not in fact generate a tsunami large enough to drown the United Kingdom, but I'm sure the idea of an autonomous, nuclear-powered underwater drone with a nuclear warhead makes everyone listening to this feel absolutely great about the future. Another weird one you might remember is the Borovesnik. This is a nuclear-powered nuclear cruise missile, where Russia has taken something pretty normal, a cruise missile with a nuclear warhead, and massively scale it up so they can fit a nuclear propulsion plant on it and give it essentially unlimited range. Now to some, that might sound more akin to a movie villain's doomsday weapon than a regular weapon of war, a fact not exactly held by the NATO callsign SSCX-9 Skyfall. But to zoom out and assess the Russian nuclear arsenal and Russian nuclear modernization efforts as a whole, I think the most reasoned position to take is to say that parts of the force might suffer from reliability or stewardship issues in some places, but if you're asking whether those problems exist to such a scale that the Russian nuclear force couldn't deter, for example, the United States, I think the answer is almost certainly no. If the Russians were planning a nuclear first strike to try and wipe out all of America's missiles before it could launch them, the way the old movies intended, in that case, things like reliability and accuracy absolutely become concerns. You have to start tasking more and more warheads against every opposing silo or target to increase the probability of a kill to an acceptable level. But if your only goal is to threaten counter-value targets, Russia has much, much, much more nuclear firepower than it could possibly need. Russia's missiles may not work all the time, no missiles work all the time, but they work enough of the time. Which might, I think, leave some of us asking the question, if the Russian nuclear forces are already good enough, why continue to invest more finite resources in expanding them or developing all sorts of crazy new superweapons? And while we can probably only guess at the real motivations, one interesting point I wanted to bring up is a speech Putin gave in 2018. There, he talked about US missile defense efforts, saying, quote, if we do not do something, eventually this, meaning the deployment of US ABMs, will result in the complete devaluation of Russia's nuclear potential, meaning that all of our missiles could simply be intercepted, end quote. He went on to say the US was primarily developing missile defense to deal with targets on ballistic trajectories, and so what Russia was going to do was develop nuclear weapons that don't follow a ballistic trajectory in order to get around those defenses. And at that point, it's probably worth noting that submarine drones typically don't follow ICBM ballistic trajectories. So there you go, Putin is saying US missile defences are getting too good, they might shoot all of our nukes down, and as a result, we have to develop a whole bunch of superweapons that can get around the missile defences. The only problem is, from a reasonable outside perspective, looking at the data we have, that idea seems completely laughable. US missile defences have nothing like the intercept account necessary to handle a nuclear attack from a country like the People's Republic of China, let alone one from the Russian Federation. As of 2021, the US had 41 ground-based interceptors intended to defend the continental United States against ICBM threats. Against an incoming missile, a single ground-based interceptor might have a success rate of about 55%. So the entire US inventory of GBIs might be expected to stop less than 10% of Russia's active ICBMs, to say nothing of any of its other nuclear weapons, including its submarine launch systems. US ballistic missile defense is intended to handle attacks from countries like North Korea, not countries like Russia. So why would Russia invest so heavily in countering a threat that doesn't exist and is unlikely to exist in the foreseeable future? In the end, there's only so far speculation will take us, so I'll close with the general assessment of the Russian nuclear arsenal as relatively modern and modernizing, supported by an active nuclear weapon industrial base, and very, very dangerous. Which brings us to another nuclear force which is still very, very dangerous, 
albeit conspicuously lacking in supervillain doomsday weapons. The PRC's nuclear weapon program really kicked off in a big way during the 1950s with significant Soviet assistance. Mao would famously fall out with the Soviets in a pretty big way, leading to Soviet assistance being withdrawn in 1960. But by that point, the Chinese had what they needed to push the program through to completion themselves, testing their first device in 1964. Through most of the Cold War, the Chinese nuclear arsenal remained relatively small and basic compared to that of the USSR or USA. There are some interesting quotes from Mao suggesting he thought that nuclear weapons might be a little bit overhyped in general. And by 1990, China was estimated to have about 230 nuclear warheads. In 1992, China would ratify the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, becoming one of five recognised and legal nuclear weapon states. In doing so, it also took on the same obligations as other NNPT members and remains a party to the treaty to this day. From a doctrinal perspective, China is very different to either the United States or Russia because it has long professed to have a no-first-use policy. There have sometimes been public Chinese documents or statements by officials that have led to some questioning of the integrity of this policy, but as recently as this year, we've seen Chinese officials reiterate the policy and its two primary provisions. Firstly, that China would never be the first party to a conflict to use nuclear weapons for any reason. And secondly, that China would never use or threaten to use a nuclear weapon against a non-nuclear state or a nuclear weapons-free zone. Another interesting note is that unlike the United States or some of the other countries we're going to look at, for China, nuclear modernization isn't really a recent phenomenon in response to an aging arsenal, but rather a continuing process which has been ongoing for decades. With the core reason being, while the United States and Soviet Union overbuilt their nuclear arsenals during the Cold War, from the point of view of getting to the minimum required level of capability for deterrence, there's an argument to suggest that China wasn't really there during most of the Cold War. To illustrate the point, in 1996, the People's Republic of China had 19 missiles capable of theoretically reaching the continental United States. 12 of those were missiles on the country's only Shah class SSBN, which of course couldn't be at sea all the time and would always be vulnerable to US nuclear attack submarines, and seven silo-launched ICBMs. According to a RAND study which wargamed nuclear first strike scenarios, in 1993, the US could get an 80% chance of destroying all of China's long-range missiles using only 23 of its 7,646 warheads. Statistically, only four Chinese warheads would typically survive the scenario, usually all on that shark class boat. And if it was sunk, destroyed, or unable to get sufficiently close to the continental United States, that was it. Game over. By 2003, the US warhead requirement for a first strike was closer to 100 warheads for 80% confidence, and the number of estimated surviving warheads increased to six. Still, obviously very risky for whatever cities in the continental United States Beijing liked the least, but also within the range where a competent missile defense system might be able to provide appropriate countermeasures. It's here I need to stress that all war game simulations, salvo models, etc. are going to have their limitations. But from a strategic stability and credible deterrence perspective, you can understand why China might not have been happy with those sort of numbers. By 2017, however, things had changed in a big way. China had developed new systems, including missiles equipped with multiple independent re-entry vehicles, and the US arsenal had shrunk considerably. The result was modelling showing that against a Chinese force which was on high alert, a US attack would leave China with 72 warheads to deliver against US cities, and against a China caught almost completely off guard, the number was still 27. At that point, you can argue deterrence is probably now well in place. You would hope it would take an awful lot for a US president to order a nuclear first strike, knowing that statistically, the likely result was the potential destruction of between 27 and 72 US cities. City number 73, Anchorage, Alaska, might be happy with its new de facto status as the most populous city in the United States and therefore obvious national capital, but 71 through 72 probably wouldn't have been too keen on being forced into a fallout cosplay. But as horrifying as that sounds, from a point of view of mutually assured destruction and strategic stability, this is probably a pretty desirable situation for both sides to be in. The United States retains a nuclear arsenal that is sized to the Russian one, but doesn't have to worry as much about the Chinese fearing some sudden first strike because they have confidence in their own deterrent. People who are worried about first strikes might get twitchy trigger fingers, and twitchy trigger fingers are not the thing you want to have around the nuclear launch button. Meanwhile, from a Chinese perspective, you could argue they now had a nuclear arsenal capable of deterring the United States, meeting the requirement of being a minimum credible deterrent, but at the same time, the arsenal was still relatively small, cheap, and efficient compared to, for example, Russia's or America's. In part for this reason, around this time, there are a number of foreign observers that expected the Chinese arsenal to start leveling out at this point. Instead, delivery system modernization continued, and as far as warheads go, it was very much a line-go-up situation. 
In 2021, the US estimated that China had 400 operational nuclear warheads. By 2023, that number was revised up to 500. That suggests a production capacity for things like new warheads and pits that significantly exceeds what the US can currently manage. The primary delivery systems include the six Jin-class SSBNs, each with up to 12 submarine-launched ballistic missiles, as well as a number of road mobile and silo-based systems. Notable ongoing developments include China's potentially dual-use hypersonic glide vehicles and the new JL-3 submarine-launched ballistic missile. That is an SLBM with a much greater range than China's previous systems, meaning that hypothetically, instead of having to sail out into the world's oceans where the US Navy doth lurk, it would be hypothetically possible for China's missile submarines to stay much closer to the Chinese coast, stay submerged in comparatively friendly waters, and launch missile attacks against the continental United States from there. China has also reportedly built 300 new nuclear missile silos in its territory for ground-based missiles, and by 2030, the current US estimate is that PRC warhead counts will reach 1,000, twice what they currently are. There are three additional comments I want to make about this apparent focus on silo construction. The first is that not all these silos may be destined to contain missiles. Instead, to an extent, you might be looking at a shell game where some silos serve as decoys to the ones that actually contain missiles. The second point, however, is that if your primary concern is deterring a heavily nuclear-armed opponent, more silo-based nukes is a pretty interesting investment choice. Siloed nukes, particularly in an era where delivery systems are getting more accurate and things like superfuses are beginning to roll out, are perhaps one of the most vulnerable parts of the triad to a potential opposing counterforce strike. And some of the inherent advantages to heavy siloed nukes, things like throw weight and precision, are in some ways much more useful in the counterforce role than they are for counter value strikes. You can certainly imagine plenty of roles for these systems in various escalation scenarios, but you also have to imagine that heavy investment in them might also be making other nuclear powers, like India, potentially a bit nervous. Because regardless of the intent behind these systems, the capability they provide might be perceived as a threat. Taken together, while it would be fair to say that China is undergoing a nuclear modernization process, it's in some ways very different from what's been happening in the USA or has happened in Russia. China, in a sense, is still in an expansion and build-up phase as opposed to just a modernization and sustainment one. The target seems to be a move towards a much larger, more complex nuclear force, with a mix of warheads and capabilities that places the People's Republic somewhere between the USA and Russia on one hand, and more limited nuclear powers like Britain and France on the other. Of course, China's nuclear planning isn't the most transparent in the world, so in the end, obviously only time will tell. But with each year that passes, it does seem that the gap between China and the other nuclear superpowers continues to narrow. Meanwhile, that rate of warhead and delivery system expansion is not being matched by the next entry on our list. That, of course, being France and its nuclear deterrent force. We've talked about French nuclear doctrine before, so I'll be pretty brief here. The force has about 240 warheads for its submarine-launched ballistic missiles, and about 50 for the ASMPA nuclear warning shot weapons. French nuclear doctrine expressly rejects a no-first-use policy, embraces counter-value targeting, and often seems very honest about the fact that it seeks to harness the horror of nuclear war in order to prevent one ever being fought. As Macron put it in 2020, quote, nuclear forces are capable of inflicting absolutely unacceptable damages upon the state's centres of power, its political, economic and military nerve centres, end quote. And when you ask what are a nation's economic and political nerve centres, the answer is almost certainly its cities. The French also specifically reject the idea of setting an exact nuclear threshold, so an oversimplified version of the doctrine would come down to the French saying they'll nuke you if you cross one of their red lines, and you knowing you've crossed one of their red lines because they'll nuke you a little bit first to show you that you're there. The French have already had a number of nuclear modernization and life extension programs in recent years, so some of their systems have a little more runway before they have to be replaced compared to others. But if you go through the major systems, just about everything is planned for a major refresh. The core focus of the French nuclear force is providing a survivable second strike capability to support minimum credible deterrence. That means the focus is on the nuclear missile submarines and the missiles they fire. As a French general put it, our deterrence capability guarantees second strike possibilities through the redundancy of resources and the invulnerability of the sea-based leg, end quote. And despite the costs involved, all elements of that sea-based leg are likely to see some work in the coming years. The French are expecting to replace their four existing SSBNs with four vessels of a new class starting in 2035. These so-called third-generation nuclear ballistic missile submarines are expected to enter service starting in 2035, have 16 launch tubes, and be slightly larger than the existing designs. Long before the French get new submarines, though, they'll get a new submarine-launched ballistic missile. 
The M51.3 is expected to start entering service in 2025, with the same warhead as existing versions, but potentially a significant increase in range. Finally, the French have already developed and rolled out a new warhead, and reportedly it optimises not for yield or low weight, but rather for service life and reliability. Because at the end of the day, it's a city-busting nuke, it's a weapon you hope you never have to use, it doesn't have to be high-speed, low-drag, it just has to be as safe, reliable and affordable as possible. The other element of France's nuclear force, the air-launched ASMPA missile, the famous warning shot, is also getting a fair amount of attention in French forward planning. Firstly, the existing missiles are going through life extension to expand their usefulness into the 2030s. That will ideally fill the requirement until what the French call a fourth-generation missile enters service in approximately 2035. What the performance characteristics of that missile will ultimately be is mostly guesswork at this point. But coupled with the Rafale F5 and eventually whatever the French sixth-generation fighter program manages to produce, the combination will almost completely refresh France's existing air-launched nuclear strike role. And when you take account of the fact that France's next-generation aircraft carrier, the PANG, is likely to enter service sometime in the late 2030s, well, then Paris may be in a better position than ever to deliver warning shots all around the world wherever they may be required. While the French nuclear refresh is comprehensive, however, it's not likely to be cheap or without its challenges. On the plus side, France seems to have the industry and facilities necessary to carry out its plans. Yes, a lot of production capacity for military fissile materials has been shut down, but the French notably have a significant stockpile of fissile materials, at least relative to the size of their arsenal, and the country has recent experience in designing, producing and fielding an entirely new type of nuclear warhead. The production capacity for new pits and warheads might not be sufficient to meet, for example, America's needs, and I'm pretty sure no one in Washington is in a hurry to ask, but for the relatively small French arsenal, you'd expect even a relatively small production capacity would likely be sufficient. The French also have some notable infrastructure dedicated to nuclear simulation and testing, including a 25 petaflop supercomputer, the Terra 1000. Having a comparatively small force, active production lines and relatively good infrastructure are all factors that might help control the cost of France's nuclear deterrent. But even with all those factors in play, in 2023, annual spending on the French nuclear deterrent was estimated at 5.3 billion euros per annum. For that, they maintain a relatively humble arsenal by the standards of some of the others on this list. But there's one last nation we'll look at today, which maintains a force that is even smaller again. We're speaking, of course, of the third nation on planet Earth to test a nuclear device, the United Kingdom. In terms of nuclear forces, the UK keeps things very, very simple. They have four active Vanguard-class nuclear missile submarines, mostly because having less than four makes having a continuous deterrent very difficult. Those nuclear submarines carry exactly one sort of nuclear weapon, the Trident missile, and while exact warhead numbers are not disclosed by the UK government, current estimates are usually about 225. Back in 2010, it even looked like the UK might cut the warhead count down further to 180, with 120 being operational, but they kind of gave up on that idea in 2021 and hiked the deployment limit back up again. In terms of doctrine, the UK seems to be very deterrence-focused, while also very clearly not being a no-first-use state. There are no nuclear cruise missiles, there are no bunker busters, there are no hypersonics, there are no warning shots. There is just at any given time at least one submarine out there somewhere, broadcasting a continuous strategic stay-off-my-lawn message to any ambitious superpower or neighbour that might harbour thoughts of doing their worst to the British Isles and their residents. Reportedly, the captain of each of these nuclear submarines has a sealed handwritten note from the British Prime Minister, which contain the orders the captain is to act on if a nuclear strike has destroyed the British government. The contents of the letters written by each British Prime Minister are closely guarded secrets but presumably they could range from telling a submarine commander to sail to an allied country, through to an instruction to bring the submarine up to launch depth, and dispatch the final regards of His Majesty's government to whatever party was responsible. Like the other powers on this list, however, Britain is grappling with the fact that delivery systems and warheads don't last forever. The Vanguard class are beginning to reach the end of their 25-year design lives, and so because a submarine-launched ballistic missile isn't much use if you don't have a submarine, the UK has an active replacement program in play. These are going to be the four submarines of the Dreadnought class, the largest submarines ever built and operated by the Royal Navy. Each submarine is expected to have a crew of 130, incorporate a range of improvements over the existing vanguards, and the first ship of the class, HMS Dreadnought, is expected to enter into service in the early 2030s. An interesting observation here about the UK's nuclear deterrent program 
is that while the submarines themselves are UK built, UK technology, for a lot of the other elements that go into a nuclear deterrent, the UK tries to control costs and industrial requirements by sharing as much as possible. The missile system, for example, is the same as the American, the Trident. In the Dreadnought class, those missiles will be stored in compartments, each capable of carrying four missiles. And that common missile compartment has been designed in cooperation with the Americans and will be the same one used on the Columbia class. With the only difference being the Dreadnought class will carry three of them and the Columbia four. And then on the simulation testing and to an extent the industrial side, there's a lot of cooperation with the French. France and the UK operate a joint facility in France, cooperate extensively on nuclear technology, and generally work together to try and harness some of the scale that neither could generate individually. Taken together, these sort of decisions come with trade-offs for the UK's nuclear deterrent. The UK does have significant indigenous capabilities covering everything from warhead assembly and plutonium pits to submarine manufacture. But the trade-off for greater cooperation and cost savings is sometimes a degree of dependence on foreign partners. As long as those relationships remain solid, however, the UK has a pretty clear plan to sustain its nuclear force for decades to come. That plan will also be supported by new dedicated infrastructure in the UK itself, which while not capable of operating on the same scale as facilities in Russia, for example, should, according to the relevant plans, be necessary to meet British requirements. In conclusion, at different times and in different ways, the world's various nuclear powers all appear to have made similar decisions. Faced with the choice between allowing their nuclear forces to atrophy and investing the massive resources necessary to renew or even expand them, all of the states we've looked at today have made the latter choice. For countries like the United States, the bulk of the modernization process is arguably just beginning. While in Russia, modernization and refurbishment have been a factor for years now, and the Chinese nuclear complex is still arguably very much in an expansion and new production phase. What that ultimately means for the world remains to be seen. But it does suggest that despite the occasional rhetoric around disarmament, the world's nuclear powers are very much planning to hold on to their capabilities for years and decades to come. Although, as we may discuss more in the future, that doesn't mean the balance of power between various nuclear arsenals won't begin to shift in a significant way in the years to come. Okay, brief channel update to close out because this was a monster video. In some ways, this episode has long been a bit of a meme. It's one I've been working on for many, many months, but it's never managed to win a Patreon or YouTube poll to get prioritised and actually finished. Recently, that finally happened, so here it is. Regarding future coverage of nuclear issues, we should pick up both India and Pakistan in the video on India in December. But until that time, I very much hope that you enjoyed today's video, that it was worth the wait, and with final closing thanks to my sponsor Ground News, let me assure you that as always, I'll see you all again next week.